Right, I'm introducing our first speaker. We're very lucky to have this uh, woman here today. She's a journalist, a writer, uh, a lifelong feminist and lesbian, and we're so thrilled to have you here, Julie Bindle. Thank you. And, and I, of course, am very lucky to be here with all of you wonderful feminists, my favourite feminists in the whole of Western Europe. And I get to miss the coronation because I live in London, <laughs> so even better. <laughs> Don't start, I'm from the northeast of England, so. Okay, so, surrogacy. Oh, and I am going to talk about men, by the way. It's fine. I am. Um, as is the tradition when I come to Glasgow, I went flying on the pavement last night when I arrived. So I'm bruised all the way down one side, which luckily you can't see, but I can feel. So if I sit down every now and again, um, that's why. But anyway, here we go. I'm on two Neurofen and they haven't run out yet. So I am going to talk about men. And I'm going to talk, of course, about surrogacy and its relationship to patriarchy and its absolute similarity to prostitution and to all forms of male violence against women. And of course, how the connectors are that the inside of a woman's body is never a suitable workplace ever. And recognizing that there are women who benefit from surrogacy arrangements, wealthy women, white women, women who use other women. But I'm going to say that its roots are within patriarchy and male violence. And the starting point being that surrogacy is an abhorrence, whether or not it is so-called altruistic or commercial, because there is a cigarette paper between the two of them, and one leads to the other, and the other feeds the other. So if we didn't have a sense of a woman's body being a suitable workplace, we wouldn't have surrogacy in the way we wouldn't have prostitution. And looking at the legislation, and I know that your proposed legislation is the same pretty much as ours in the UK, that would further normalise and entrench this practice. And it would also mean that there was no such thing as a valid critique from a feminist human rights standpoint of surrogacy. Now... I say that because there are religious fundamentalists and hard-line conservatives that have a problem with surrogacy. And often that's, they're the same people that have a problem with lesbians or with women's reproductive rights. And they're against sperm donation and they don't like lesbians raising children. They don't like women raising children without men. And it's not to say I'm against them being against surrogacy. <clears throat> Excuse me. But that's not why I'm against surrogacy. And I think we have to be very careful who we give credence to, whose aims and objectives we further, if they say they also don't like surrogacy, because to join forces with some of these people means that we're putting our other rights, our reproductive rights, at risk. And I'm not a political purist, <coughs> okay? And I will form coalitions with other reasonable people. Not that I'm reasonable, but I will form coalitions <laughs> with reasonable people. Okay, so the current, as I understand it, and I know I'm in Scotland, so you will correct me when I'm wrong. As I understand it, uh, what is being proposed here is that the changes will benefit only the buyers. I will not use commissioning parents, if I can help it. Will only benefit the buyers of these babies. Will make it easier for them to take legal control of the woman's body and her baby. And will give more power to the lawyers who make a huge amount of money from this trade <laughs> and other brokers. So... Currently, in the UK and in Scotland and, and elsewhere, the baby, the, the birth mother, is the legal parent of the baby. And the buyers, back home, it's after six weeks, 
can then apply to adopt via a parental order. And therefore, when that baby is born, the legal parent is its birth mother. And these poor buyers go through this terrible time during the pregnancy, thinking, what if she changes her mind? And apparently, these changes is not just about red tape and legislation to clarify who's on the birth certificate and who owns this child. It's about the stress and the hell that the buyers go through. Because what if she keeps the baby? Now, why should they worry about that? I thought surrogacy was a straightforward, simple transaction. One made through love and kindness. Have you heard that? Be kind, women. Do something nice for the men. And she should be perfectly happy to hand over this baby because it's not her baby, remember? All of the surrogacy organisations across the UK, for example, that I've interviewed, they all talk about how the women don't feel a maternal bond because, of course, she knows it's not her baby. They also talk about how the women are very happy to do this for their brother who's gay in a relationship with another man or for her infertile sister or best friend or just a woman who she meets through a Facebook group because isn't infertility terrible? So we on the one hand have this complete disconnect from women and their babies and we haven't even got to the rights of the child yet. But we also have this sense from others that they can own this piece of merchandise that they have commissioned. And so commissioning parent has got a sinister ring to it, doesn't it? So of course, things go terribly wrong. I've never had babies, I've never had children, I never wanted to have children but I understand that there is a connection and I understand that this is something that causes women great pain. And let's have a look at the altruism first. In a way, this is the most sinister arrangement, in a way. And again, I connect it to prostitution and systems of prostitution, where you have decriminalization and legalization of brothels and what that means is the normalisation of prostitution for the buyer is complete. His needs and his rights are protected, whilst women have no right under these regimes to say, I need exiting programmes, I need trauma therapy and counselling, I need help and support, because why would she? It's just a job. Well, why would a woman go through a terrible traumatic ordeal when her baby is taken from her? When it's just an arrangement. And this is where the connections are most deeply entrenched, I think. So the laws are all geared towards helping the buyers by taking away the legal right of that mother, the birth mother, to change her mind, to keep her baby. And so you hear about the sob stories from buyers there's one on the BBC News website today. Have a look. Let me see these charmers' names. A gay male couple in Derry who is saying that the law is cruel, inhumane. They've been trying for a baby. They've been trying for a baby last time I looked. <laughs> right? I mean, I know things evolve, but... They suffered a miscarriage... First time round, these fellas, <laughs> they got counselling, and they've got a huge page in this, did I even write it down, um, in the uh, BBC? No, nope, can't find it. Anyway, you can find it easily. The feminists are already kicking off, as we do, <laughs> about this case. And the sympathy goes with them. Because, of course, isn't it terrible that men are infertile? Well, do you know what? Men are infertile. And do you think... Oh, Patrick and John Coyle. And Patrick's sister is the birth mother. And isn't it interesting the way that 
we talk about infertility as an illness, which I know often it's linked to health and medical problems, but that we focus on every which way that we can supply babies to privileged people that don't mind using the wombs of less privileged women. We talk about it as a right. Everybody has the right to their own child. No, they do not. Absolutely we do not. And when did this become embedded in our social consciousness? That you have to have your own baby. That you have to have something in your image. And that people that actually don't have babies, men, have the right to do so. And the number of times that I've been labelled homophobic, anti-gay, bigoted for saying that gay men are the front now. They are the, they are the poster people for surrogacy now. They're the minority of those commissioning babies, but they are now the face of the surrogacy industry, and it is an industry. So I just want to tell you about a couple of... Um, visits I've made to countries where commercial surrogacy is completely... <laughs> is there a man in the room? <laughs> or a lesbian, what I do want to do. <laughs> so if the disingenuous Scottish government or my government that are saying we need to safeguard against exploitation in countries such as India where, or Thailand or Georgia or Ukraine where commercial surrogacy is legalised, what exactly are we safeguarding against? What is it that we're going to do differently? If we allow commercial payment as opposed to expenses for women who give birth to a baby that's then bought by somebody else. Because as far as I can see, there'll be no difference. If you're paying a fee for surrogacy services, you can advertise. Now, I was in New York City a year ago because they just passed a law to sanction commercial surrogacy. And it was horrific. I went to a clinic on Park Avenue, which is unbelievably expensive, luxurious real estate. You have to be making a lot of money to have an office there. And I met these brokers. They were telling me that they have a huge um, Indian uh, American clientele and they want to use eggs from Indian women. Now they call it egg donation, but it's not donation, is it? because no woman donates her eggs. It's a painful, dangerous, lengthy process, and it can cause infertility and other health problems for her. So young women that are found through catalogues, because it's half of their genetic material is going to make up this baby that they've commissioned, they sell their eggs in order to put themselves through college or feed their own children, or whatever. Or as an alternative to prostitution. And the clinic then chooses women to carry the baby. And this man was telling me proudly that they have managed to get more white women as carriers than African-American women. And I said, why is that an issue? And I was interviewing him with as blank a face as I could possibly manage. And he said, because the commissioning parents think their baby might come out black if it's carried by a black woman. So when they're looking through these catalogues to see what kind of look they, they are going to end up with, with their baby, they also look into her family history. Is there any mental health, any other health issues? Does she have diabetes or asthma in the family, bipolar, anything like that? So they're basically crafting this human being in a way that you can only really describe as eugenics. And then it minded me of India. So our British government, they were saying, well, we can't end up like India. 
But actually, India and New York State, there's no difference in the way that they run their services. Because back in India, in Gujarat, which is the <coughs> excuse me, capital of the surrogacy trade in India, which was the capital of the surrogacy industry in the East, they run along the same lines. They advertise huge billboards, advertising surrogates, advertising eggs for sale, advertising the IVF clinics. And when I talked to the clinicians in India <clears throat> and asked about the race of the clients and the ethnicity of the babies and the like, she told me that obviously the white parents from overseas, the Europeans, want white babies, but they don't mind an Indian woman carrying the baby because they understand that the baby has no genetic relationship to that woman, which I'm sure there are others in the room that would discount that. But either way, they're satisfied with that. And I said, so you get your eggs from white women. Where are they? Oh, they're in Ukraine. They're in Georgia. She named all the places where women are routinely trafficked into prostitution, live in dire poverty, where there's unrest, war, etc. And she showed me this wall of photographs of happy, smiling parents with their newly delivered babies. And she said, oh, actually, this one, and there's white parents and a baby, this one did ask for an Indian woman's egg because she really wanted brown eyes for her child. <coughs> and I asked her about domestic violence. I said, if you have women living in your hostels, which they do, the pregnant women live in what they call surrogacy house that in Gujarat, this huge place where the women sleep on mattresses, tend to a room. If a woman is experiencing domestic violence through pregnancy, if she refuses to come and live in this hostel, what do you do? And she says, oh, we bring her into the hostel, we make sure she's safe. Mm -hmm. And what happens when she's given birth? Well, we send her back home. Because it's only the product that matters. And I asked the same question six, seven years later to the clinic clinicians in New York and I got the same answer the safeguarding is only for the unborn child not for the for the mother so I saw advertising for eggs IVF services surrogacy services on the subway in New York City and it was surreal and it really did mind me of the way that legal prostitution is advertised in Germany and in Holland. There's something deeply sinister about the fact that women are used in this way. And then, of course, we get to the rights of the child. Now, Kent University, which is one of those universities, I mean, I can say proudly, I've been deplatformed five times. <laughs> from Kent University, from pretty much every school. I think the law school, criminology, social sciences, they've all kicked off a sea of blue fringes to <laughs> greet me on the campus. And they have a department that's got bored with shrilling for pimps and talking about decriminalising all aspects of prostitution. And they've turned their eyes to surrogacy. They want to completely legalise commercial surrogacy. And they've helped the Law Commission in the UK to push through the proposals which would do that. And by the way, just a little note, I don't know what the scene is here, but we can give £14,000 in legitimate expenses um, to a woman under the altruistic non-commercial surrogacy laws that we have currently. Now, £14,000 is a salary for low-income women, for women who are desperate, for women with no other employment opportunities. So you can't tell me that's not an incentive. So Kent University put this seminar on, and I, um, Jane Smith, 
signed up to go to it. And at the end of these appalling um, presentations on how great surrogacy is, and it was the rights of the commissioning parents, the rights of them to do this, the rights of them to have that, the concerns about the mental health of commissioning parents. And I asked at the end, have you done an evaluation on the effects on older children born through surrogacy? Because, of course, we're now at a stage where there are adults having been born through this method. And they said, yes, yes. <clears throat> and we found, actually, it's no different from adoption. It's no worse. They didn't say worse. That there are no more... We have no more concerns than with adoption. I said, but adoption's a massive thing. But we know that there are huge consequences through adoption. I, I take no position during this presentation on adoption. But we know the damage that this causes. And you say that this is just fine. Because what you're actually doing, I suggested, before I was asked to leave the room, <laughs> was, was that you're unlike with adoption, where babies need or children need to be parented in non-abusive, safe ways because they're in the world. You're bringing babies into the world purposely and causing this pain and harm, and why? Why are you doing this? For what? And of course, nobody can answer the question. It's the same as when you say, why do men need to pay for sex? Because we know they don't. Because his pleasure means more than her pain, and it always will. So I interviewed a woman called Harriet, who... You can hear the three-part interview on my Substack, which you can sign up to for free and easily access. And please do listen to her story. Because Harriet is one of those that is campaigning against the legalisation and normalisation of surrogacy. And I think it's important that we need to say that we are against surrogacy per se. We cannot have a halfway measure here. We have to condemn surrogacy in its entirety, because there's no such thing as a non-commercial surrogacy arrangement, even under the expenses rule. And Harriet did this as a favour for a family friend, two gay men. She had two of her own children. She wanted to help them out. She was also quite broke. The money came in handy. She needed a new car. They controlled her from the beginning. It all went terribly wrong. She was desperately psychologically damaged and traumatised at handing over the baby. And she went to court under duress and agreed to the parental order. And then, of course, she decided she was having none of this. They wouldn't let her see the child. They promised that she could see the child, take part in his life. And they reneged on this because who wants some woman around with her vagina? that the baby came out of, when they can just be the parents. They even said to the court that her reversing the decision on the parental order and her having a legal place in this child's life would make them feel differently about the child. The entitlement of these men is beyond belief. Well, it isn't, but... She went back to court and she reversed the parental order because it was recognised that it had been given under duress. If we have any further rights in law for the buyers, this means a loss of rights for women. It also means, yet again, women's status in society is downgraded. We're seen even more so as vessels for the convenience of those more privileged, of those wealthier, of those with institutionalised power and privilege in relation to the birth mother. And it ultimately means the commercialisation of pregnancy and of childhood, of babies. And I'll just end by saying what the worst thing I've ever seen, ever, relating to this atrocity, and this is what we have coming, if we don't resist it. In India, a woman gave birth to a baby for a rich white couple who ordered a C-section as they usually do 
because they want to be able to travel conveniently from Europe to India, wherever, to collect their baby at their convenience. So in other words, the baby is born to order. And one rich gay male couple told me that they didn't want their baby coming out of a woman's vagina because that's disgusting. But the C-section is usually for convenience as opposed to repulsion. It's bad enough, isn't it? So they turn up at the hospital. She's in pieces having to hand over this infant. She's wailing and sobbing. And it turns out that the female part of this couple hadn't received the order of breast milk. There's, a, there's breast milk businesses all over in Cambodia run by rich Americans for surrogate parents and for gay male couples and for single straight male couples that order babies, by the way. So the breast milk trade is booming off the back of this. Of course, I visited the breast milk factory in Cambodia, of course. And it was run by two Mormon men who were probably some of the... If I believed in evil, they would be slotted right in in the front row. Anyway, so the frozen milk hadn't arrived. It was all terribly inconvenient. They were jet-lagged. So they paid the woman extra to breastfeed the baby. And I think that is the cruelest thing I can imagine. Fuck them all. Absolute bastards. We have to resist. We have to condemn surrogacy in its entirety. It's a major human rights issue for women and for children. Thank you. Yeah.